Now that we have the tool of the slow growing hierarchy to analyze in a little bit more down to earth way um, what various big ordinals are going to give us, um, even if in the back of our mind we were interested more interested more interested in the fast growing hierarchy, I want to go back to some comments I made at the start of when I was talking about Veblen and uh, and recast them a little bit. So th the question is if we're interested in the fast growing hierarchy and and why does it work so well? Why does it create such big functions? Um, I want to focus on two ingredients, and one of the one is basically the one I talked about with the Veblen, and then there's another one that's going to be really important. So the first one is this idea of alternating uh, recursion, iteration, and diagonalization. So in other words, as we've seen, you create a mechanism of recursive iteration, meaning if you've got one of the fast-growing hierarchy, like f omega, for example, then f omega plus one is defined by iterating, repeating that previous one so that's a recursive iteration that you're taking what the a version of the same thing uh and and using that to create the next stage that's the recursive part and the iteration is simply just do it over and over again for a certain number of times um and then for the next one of course f omega plus two you do the previous one over and over again um and what that gives you as we've seen many times is that gives you a new slot to diagonalize over Omega, omega plus one, omega plus two, omega plus three, omega plus four. Oh, okay. Then omega two, of course, was created by diagonalizing over that and letting that be part of the input. So that's what we know. And I've mentioned how Veblen kind of emulates that part of the story for f. But in thinking about um, the ordinal collapsing function story, I feel like uh, what's crucial to that is that there was another thing about the fast-growing hierarchy that um, that Veblen doesn't really take advantage of in the same way, and that's the use of specifically of ordinal arithmetic as a way to organize these great patterns of uh, recursive iteration and diagonalization, especially this kind of alternation that I've talked about already in the last few videos that makes things so big. And so ordinal arithmetic is a great way to create, well, new ordinals. Um, and it's up through uh, epsilon naught, it's a great way to create what turns out to be super powerful patterns to create fast growing uh, functions. And those, those patterns, of course, in terms of ordinals, is the alternation between successor and limit. And then that gets translated into the alternation between right now, am I recursively iterating? Am I building a, a new uh, sequence of functions based on recursive, like iterating? the function that came before, or am I diagonalizing? Okay, so we want to use ordinal arithmetic to its maximum. And uh, so now we want to see what what happens if we try to make that go past uh, f epsilon naught, okay? So we know that Veblen basically, or one way to think about it, is that it emulates this stuff up here, number one, alternating recursion and uh, diagonalization. That's one way to look at the Veblen hierarchy. Um, and that creates very large ordinals. Of course, they're still countable ordinals. All of the ordinals we want, we're going to be using to, um, to organize the, the F function have to be countable because they have to say, essentially be algorithms. They have to be essentially very simplified computer programs. Um, and of course, it takes those ordinals and uses those in F. And we've also seen how they can work in the function g as a shadow of f. Okay, but my point is that it doesn't seem to emulate the Veblen story. Doesn't seem to emulate the ordinal arithmetic, arithmetic stuff, and that's what we're going to be able to use in the ordinal collapsing functions. So the question is, it's a little hard to figure out how would you emulate part two um, when we've already seems to have, we seem to have maxed out the power of ordinal arithmetic. We went through omega to the omega to the omega dot 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 and epsilon naught is kind of famous as the thing that's beyond ordinary ordinal arithmetic at least in some simple maybe simplistic sense okay well there's definitely more you can do just simply with ordinal arithmetic in a fairly pedestrian way um, we can definitely take powers of epsilon naught and even towers like double ups of epsilon naught and we will use that as a, a very beginning step um, Turns out to be very, very analogous of the way the Veblen story works, which is uh, you take epsilon naught, you add one to get out of the fixed point trap, because otherwise raising omega to the epsilon naught will not give you anything new. 
Um, but once you add the one, you can do omega to the omega, etc. And Veblen writes that in terms of the Veblen functions as take phi one of zero, add one of it, get out of the fixed point trap, and then phi naught it repeatedly. Okay. Um, we will all even end up using the repeated epsilon function. Say take epsilon naught, and then take the epsilon naught epsilon, and then that epsilon, and then that epsilon. And that, again, it can be expressed as a Veblen function. So there's going to be some overlap at the start. But here's the real power. We're going to use ordinal arithmetic, ordinary ordinal arithmetic, on a very new ordinal, omega. And omega is going to be um, an uncountable ordinal. And so qualitatively bigger uh, than all the ordinals we've done before. Um, and I'm going to not say a lot about this, the particularities of countable versus uncountable. Um, I, mean, I guess I'm going to assume you know a little bit about that if you're going this far with ordinal stuff. Um, but we're really not going to use something, anything particularly subtle about it. Um, it's not something we're ever going to put directly into an F or a G. We're not going to directly use any uncountable ordinals to try to describe some sort of iteration recursion scheme because it just, just doesn't make sense because it can't, it's just too big um, to describe some sort of algorithmic process. But what we're really going to use it as is just a formal symbol. We, and we're, again, that's why we're not going to need to know too much about countable versus uncountable and cardinality and all that kind of stuff. Um, we're just going to use it to leverage further use of ordinal arithmetic. And it's going to take a few more videos to show that, because I, I need to get up to the point where we're really ready to use omega, a big omega. Um, and one way to think about it is we're going to build, it's not the way it's usually expressed, maybe not the best way, but it's not a horrible way to think about it, as building a new family of functions from ordinals to ordinals, kind of like the Veblen functions. Um, and instead of indexing like the Veblens by like 0, 1, 2, 3, omega, various ordinals, things like that, um, we're going to basically index them by ordinal arithmetic expressions in this new placeholder omega. And they're also going to involve little omega and 1, 2, all the, all the ordinals we've used already. Okay, so that's, it's a little bit hand wavy at this point, but I wanted to set the scene for where we're going with the rest of it. Now there's various different and somewhat hard to compare versions of ordinal collapsing functions. Um, the Wikipedia article on ordinal collapsing functions has a nice distillation and sort of simplification to the essentials, and I'm going to follow that. Um, and so we'll just create a single function, psi, that takes an ordinal and spits out another ordinal. And uh, its outputs are always going to be countable ordinals and things that are exactly ready to put into F or G. Um, and there's a few ways to think about it, a few ways to define it. There's a rather elegant but not very explicit way to do it, is, which is kind of the most official definition. Um, it's a, a not super constructive kind of definition. And we'll probably need to return to that eventually to make sure we're not doing something that's just completely contradictory or ambiguous. But um, I don't want to emphasize that right at the start. What I'm going to do is by, do it by explicitly giving fundamental sequences. Every time I define psi of a new bigger ordinal, um, I'm really going to say it's the limit of this very particular fundamental sequence. And one reason for that is the, what we're using these for is to put them into f and g, and so we need fundamental sequences anyway, and it's very concrete. Okay, so um, just for a start, we'll just in the rest of this video, we'll just give you the start, and it won't be very new, and it's quite, quite similar, although not identical to the start of the Veblen story. We're going to start out with psi of 0 is epsilon naught. You can start out with lower ordinals if you want, but we might as well start here, because um, under that, everything is 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 pretty straightforward with ordinal arithmetic. Um, and we need, of course, a fundamental sequence for epsilon naught. There's a few standard choices that just differ by, well, there's two that differ by one. Um, I'm going to use something that's a little bit different from, like, maybe 10 videos ago, but it, it's going to make the formulas much nicer. And that's that the, the nth uh, term in the fundamental sequence leading up to psi of 0, or epsilon naught, is just omega double up n, okay? So the when n equals 1, it's just going to be omega. When n equals 2, it's going to be omega to the omega. When n equals 3, it's going to be omega to the omega to the omega. 
Okay. Um, so that's our start. Psi of zero is is a familiar guy, but of course something that is already super powerful for creating um, f an f function. So the successor rule, um, and unfortunately I have to say for most alpha, and literally that's not literally true, um, but for all the alpha that we're going to encounter really in the core process of creating new big ordinals and new big big uh, fast growing functions um, we have a very simple successor rule which is if you know psi of alpha if you have understood that then psi of alpha plus one is what you get by uh, uh, taking the fundamental sequence psi of alpha plus one of n is just going to be again a, a double up. It's going to be repeatedly exponentiating psi of alpha. So to be really explicit about that, if you want to know what psi of 1 is, it's the limit of a certain sequence, and let's say the third term of that sequence, the fundamental sequence leading up to psi of 1, is just psi of 0 to the psi of 0 to the psi of 0. And of course that's, if you if you really want it a little more explicitly, that's epsilon naught to the epsilon naught to the epsilon naught. And I'm going to make some comments about some tricky things about, um, well, kind of fun things about ordinal exponents, but um, not quite yet. Okay. So, for example, um, I'm not going to focus on f for a little while, as I said. Let's just figure out, let's just figure out g of psi of 1, um, and let's say apply, put 3 into it, and then we'll, then we'll cut this video off. So, it's g of psi of 1 of 3. Uh, by definition, I just said the fundamental sequence is you exponentiate psi of, of zero, you can put it in a small double up chain there with three terms, okay? Um, and then what do you do? Well, whenever you have um, any exponentiated chain, this is always, this is still true, it's the kind of thing we did before, and you want to look at the third term of the fundamental sequence for that, you're going to put in, again, what's the fundamental sequence for the top thing in the chain, and that by definition is omega to the omega to the omega, okay? Well, this is still very much a limit ordinal, and even that top thing is still a limit ordinal, but I'm going to cut to the chase. We've seen that when you expand out omega to the omega to the omega, you get this kind of um, sequence, which is essentially that Goodstein kind of thing, which if you put in omega is the number three, you're literally just getting the um, hereditary base three expansion of the numbers 26 down, th oh no, sorry, <laughs> you're getting three to the three to the three minus one, all the way down to one. So there's going to be like a trillion-ish terms in this sum. And then what do you do with that? And I'm certainly not going to take this out all the way because we're beyond the point where we can do that. Um, but let me just, again, show you the, f the feel for it, and then we'll, we'll do it more systematically in the start of the next video. So notice what I did here is I wrote the last thing, which would be, usually we'd say an omega has turned into a three, but I purposely wrote it as a two plus one. And that's because that one, that's the one thing in the first phase of the expansion that we pick off, and we recognize that psi of zero, this psi of zero here, to this big thing plus one is psi of zero to the big thing times psi of zero. Just using ordinary rules of exponents, which totally do apply. Um, this rule applies at least to, uh, to ordinals. And then that turns into an omega to the omega to the omega, okay? Then that expands out, expands out, expands out until you get this big chain of three to the three to the three terms, and then you distribute. Okay, so now we've got that thing without the one, and that is multiplied by what we already had, the psi of zero to that thing without the one, plus just plain psi of zero to this, this big chain, okay? Um, but with just, just times a one, okay. Well, we're done. We're, we're, we're getting sick of that, okay? We can see that this is going to be utterly huge. And remember, we're just trying to calculate g. All we really want to figure out is um, if I keep just using the third term in the expansion every time I get a, a limit ordinal and I'm dropping down, um, just how many terms am I going to get? And even doing that, I can. there's just no prayer of doing that explicitly, which makes sense because we already knew that even at this level, the psi of zero level, we're getting uh, we're getting double ups. We're getting three double up three, that kind of stuff, and it's going to be bigger. But how much bigger? 
And so we really need to be more systematic and think more about inductive and recursive rules as opposed to just brute forcing everything. And that's what we'll we'll do next time. Um, it's still going to be a couple videos before we really get into the heart of the ordinal collapsing functions, but I think it's really helpful as we go to focus on the G function and to get some sort of down-to-earth sense of what kind of um, power we're getting at each stage.